Good morning, everyone. My name is Arun Variku, and today I'm going to present a tactical approach to threat hunting uh, uh, to unmask ransomware operations. Uh, before we uh, do that, I just wanted to uh, talk a, a bit about me. Like Murray mentioned, I host a podcast known as Cyber from the Compliance. If you are into podcasts, it's available on Spotify and YouTube. Uh, I also lead the Cyber Threat Intelligence Americas team at BNP Paribas and am uh, the chair of FSI SAC Threat Hunting Working Group as well. Uh, there are uh, a couple of uh, links I have added here because I love to do research on cyber threat attribution and cyber criminal profiling. And if you guys are interested in that, do check that out. It's uh, on the internet as well. With that, let's take a look at the agenda of today. So I want to start with this. Threat hunting is intelligence driven and should be intelligence driven. And uh, the first thing I want to touch upon briefly is the Intel driven threat hunting framework. Next, uh, we are going to do a comparative TTP analysis on ransomware. This exercise is very, very important because it, a, it allows you to understand the techniques and tactics used by different ransomware groups out there. And B, that is what you use eventually to do your hunts. So a very, very important uh, thing to do. Uh, third, we are going to then take it a step further and look at some hunt packages or hunt use cases uh, that map to some of the techniques heavily used by ransomware groups. Uh, and fourth, I will also briefly talk about how you can scale your threat hunting program and make, make it viable and repeatable within your organization. Finally, a couple of key takeaways that I want you all to remember uh, from this presentation. Uh, so with that, let's dive into Intel Driven Threat Hunting Framework. Uh, I want to start with defining what is threat hunting. Threat hunting is a proactive approach to detect malicious activities within your environment that were not previously detected by your detective controls in place. So some correlate uh, threat hunting to IOC search. I beg to defer on that. IOC search is just looking at historical observations, but threat hunting is more proactive. You focus on techniques rather than IOCs when you look, uh, talk about threat hunting. So what are the objectives of a threat hunt? Uh, number one, you want to detect intrusions that remain undetected, but the overarching goal of your threat hunting program should uh, also be to improve your security posture by detecting uh, detection gaps and, uh, so that you can augment those uh, your threat detection capabilities as well. Uh, and then there are three important prerequisites that you want to know, uh, you need to know before you go on the road of threat hunting. Uh, and if you remember in my opening statement, I said uh, threat hunting is intelligence driven. Uh, well, this is exactly why it is intelligence driven. Number one, a very, very and most important prerequisite is that you want to understand your adversary. You want to understand the threat actors that are relevant uh, and most potentially most impactful to your organization. Uh, you want to understand their behaviors, their techniques of interest, uh, which is then what you will eventually hunt on. Uh, the second important prerequisite is uh, you need to understand your telemetry within your organization, what data sources are uh, uh, you have within your organization, uh, within your environment that provide artifacts related to the threat actor activities. And third, uh, you also need to understand your organization's environment. What is normal within your environment? That is something you need to understand. Now, there's a small caveat. When you start actually doing your threat hunt, uh, you may not have the full picture of the baseline, but as you go on that road, you start learning about it and you need to document all of that information uh, for your future hunts as well. Well, as an example, I can, think of as uh, uh, ransomware groups like to stage their data before exfiltrating that data. And some of the tools that they use is SenseF, NSAP, et cetera. And these are some of the tools that you may find being legitimately used within your organization as well. So when you run a query uh, on data staging and uh, you see some events uh, out there, do not think that you have hit the jackpot. It could just be the case of normal activity going out there. So you need to understand what is normal uh, before you uh, do your analysis. Uh, 
me go to the next slide. So threat, uh, so I briefly wanted to also talk about the threat hunt life cycle. It's really six steps makes uh, your threat hunt uh, hunting program repeatable. First is like I mentioned, you need to research threats. Uh, you need to understand their behavior of threat actors that are actually relevant to your organization. Second is you want to formulate a hypothesis, a simple statement that you can test uh, against the threat activity of interest that you want to hunt on. Uh, the third step is you want to build search queries. Uh, this is where your understanding on data sources what are at your disposal co disposable co uh, come to come into the picture, and uh, this is where you uh, build your logic around how you can hunt. Uh, now, in certain cases, uh, there may be multiple queries that you need to create to test your hypothesis. Just wanted to highlight that as well. Uh, the fourth step is very, very important uh, that I always like to call out emulation. You want to validate your hunt queries before actually running them. You want to make sure that they actually work. So uh, this is why this is why emulation comes into the picture and uh, you can uh, use your purple team. You can collaborate with them and uh, use them for testing your uh, te uh, queries or you can also use atomic red uh, packages for the same exercise. The fifth step is execution and analysis. This is where you determine whether the queries uncovered any activity that supports your initial hypothesis. So as an example, if your hypothesis was RMM tools were being used for uh, persistence or lateral movement, because if you look at a lot of reports these days, uh, ransomware groups like to use RMM tools uh, for persistence and lateral movement. Uh, uh, they abuse that a lot. So that if that is the hypothesis, when you come to the analysis stage, uh, make sure that uh, you look at what are the RMM tools that you uh, that are considered legitimate within your organization, and then go from there. The final step is post and action actions. This is where the first step is: did you did find an intrusion? If that is the case, you hand it off to your IRT, uh, who then actually start the incident response. If you did not find an intrusion, uh, but found a detection gap, that's when you want to translate your queries into Sigma detection rules that you can then share with your detection team and they uh, build detections around that. And you also want to document that I mentioned previously, document documentation of what is normal, what was considered normal in your environment is very important for future hunt activities. Uh, and uh, this is how the framework looks like. I'm not going to spend a lot of time since I already talked about the threat hunt life cycle. Uh, just wanted to highlight how your threat hunt works with different teams, uh, your CTI team that drives threat research, your purple team, your threat detection team, as well as incident response team. Uh, with that, let's take a look at uh, the comparative TTP analysis since 2022. Now I used uh, the following collection sources uh, for my analysis. D4 report is really, really good. It has a treasure trove of information on, uh, on an intrusion from start to end, provides techniques. It also provides artifacts that you can then translate into queries. Then CISA's uh, cybersecurity advisory on stop ransomware is a very good resource to understand uh, the techniques used. So are the threat research blocks uh, from vendors that I highlighted here. Uh, uh, then you have the red canaries threat detection reports that provide a lot of information on techniques used by uh, threat actors and they also rank them so a good resource to look into and finally uh, you uh, have MITRE attack that you want to leverage a lot uh, speaking of MITRE uh, here is the whole list of attack MITRE attack techniques but when I did my analysis I found uh, based on those collection sources and the reports that I used I found that there is a subset of tech tactics and techniques, uh, essentially techniques used by ransomware groups out there, which you are seeing right now on your screen. And in numbers, if you look at the numbers, uh, there are 54 techniques in all leveraged by ransomware groups, 33 sub techniques. And uh, what was interesting to me was uh, there are 11 techniques commonly used by different ransomware groups out there, all the way from execution to impact. So there's a lot of overlap in terms of the techniques leveraged by uh, different ransomware groups. So in my next section, I'm just going to walk you through some of those uh, techniques, how we can create uh, 
hunt packages around them. So let's uh, uh, start with execution, especially a T1059.001 PowerShell, which is very, uh, one of the top techniques used by adversaries as well as ransomware groups out there. Uh, as you all know, PowerShell is also used by system administrators for automating their tasks, but it's abused a lot by uh, threat actors to obfuscate their malicious code or uh, download malicious code. A simple example here is a phishing email uh, with a malicious attachment, and which when clicked executes an encoded PowerShell that leads to uh, the download of the malware, and which is exactly what we are going to uh, create a hunt for in the next slide. So here's the process that uh, I would like to walk you through uh, for developing a hunt package. So the first thing you want to do is research. Uh, these are the two artifacts that I wanted to highlight that provided uh, very good information on uh, the methods used for uh, using this particular technique around PowerShell. So, uh, and these uh, reports are all in, uh, added in the sources at the end. Uh, so you can pretty much go through them as well. So once you have a very good understanding on the behavior and the technique used, uh, you want to formulate your hypothesis, which in this case is PowerShell used for downloading and executing a malicious binary. And the next step is then you want to develop a query logic and write a query uh, that uh, you will then eventually test your hypothesis against. So this is an example of the Helm query. Again, uh, on the left, you'll see an uh, artifact from D4 report that shows the encoded PowerShell command executing uh, that drop session gopher. So you can pretty much look at the command uh, that was used and use that information and translate that into a query logic, uh, which uh, you, you see on the right. In this particular, particular case, the parent process was run dll32.exe or command.exe, but it does not have to be that way. It could be something else as well. Uh, then there's another, uh, query uh, again from an, uh, another artifact from default report and the query logic that you can use to uh, for your hunt uh, when you want to build your hunt queries uh, again you in terms of telemetry you can use different data sources windows event logs sysmon is a very good piece of, uh, data source uh, and then you can also use either edr data as a data source for uh, running your queries uh, uh, one thing that I would like to caution here is PowerShell hunt queries on PowerShell are very, very noisy just because of the fact that this admin system admins use the, uh, the, power, the the same PowerShell commands for their legitimate purposes as well. So when you uh, execute this particular query and you see a lot of hits, then the first thing that you want to do is identify the outliers. Just read out the repeatable stuff and just focus on the outliers, the system that is normally not seen in those queries. That's how you start documenting what is baseline. And uh, the another uh, thing that I like to do is I like to look at the parent process and also the parent parent process, because in certain cases, if you see, say, for example, notepad.exe as parent parent process, that is something that you want to investigate. That could be an indication of a malicious activity. Uh, Next, I briefly would like to also talk about discovery, a uh, very common tactic used by ransomware groups out there. Uh, so again, in, from a threat research perspective, I, uh, I would like to highlight these two reports, one from Trend Micro and the other from Defer. Uh, so the Trend Micro report is interesting because it shows you how uh, Qbot was used as an initial payload for discovery and then uh, deploying additional uh, payloads like Cobalt Strike. And then finally, that led to the deployment of Black Blaster uh, ransomware. And DFER report provides a very good artifact uh, artifact on how uh, add find was used as a tool for discovery. So uh, again, the hypothesis here could be as simple as a ransomware group may be conducting discovery activity post compromise, and which is what. Uh, and then uh, the next step again is to develop your query logic uh, based on the artifacts you see. So this case, in this case, the first query is around discovery conducted by malware. What is interesting here is that this is not only the case of discovery, but also the case of process injection. Because if you see on the left, 
Qbot is running inside another process, WERMGR.exe, and conducted conducting automated econ. That is not normal for WERMGR.exe. That is a process used by Microsoft for just reporting bugs. That is not something that you see coming out of that process. So this is, again, a case of uh, process injection as well as discovery. So in here on the right, you see how you can convert that into your query. You have the pay process. And if you see all these commands running in a stipulated time frame, say like five minutes, that is something that you want to check and investigate. It could be a case of discovery. Again, you can use different uh, log sources here that I highlighted. Uh, the the second one is uh, around discovery conducted by Hunt Find. Again, uh, the artifact is from a default report. Uh, it's uh, Ad Find is a query tool that you can use to enumerate uh, search active dis discovery, and this is a tool heavily abused by threat actors as well. So you want to uh, hunt on that as well, and this is the query uh, on the right that you can use. And when you put these two queries together, and you if you see the hits coming in from us, the same system, that is when you, that gives you an indication that this could be a case of, uh, this could be an intrusion ha already happening and a case of discovery from uh, post compromise. So that's how uh, you use two different queries to test your initial hypothesis. Uh, next, I briefly uh, will touch upon later movement and just because there's a lot I wanted to cover. Uh, and uh, again, uh, you can uh, formulate a hypothesis around low labs, maybe use to download malicious code, code threat actors, at ransomware groups love to use low labs uh, and abuse them a lot. So you want to create queries around these as well. Uh, uh, and here's an example of how you can do that. Uh, adversaries love to use search util and search rec uh, for downloading malicious uh, tools and this is the logic that i just wanted to highlight here i'm not going to walk you through this uh, because you kind of get the picture how you can uh, develop your queries um, then another uh, way they do it is through wmic uh, is heavily abused a lot uh, so if you see some activity around wmic you need to again understand what is normal within your environment and then find the outliers uh, from that. Uh, uh, then finally, I also wanted to talk about impact, uh, especially T1490 inhibit system recovery. And in this particular case, uh, uh, you there is a very good artifact from this paper report that is highlighted here from Screen Connect to High Ransomware in 61 hours uh, that provides a very good idea on how uh, uh, this particular technique is used, and you can simply create a hypothesis saying that a ransomware group may be deleting all shadows, shadow copies and altering boot settings. This is something that they love to do before uh, or during encryption as well. So develop query logics around that, as, as, around this particular hypothesis as well. Uh, and uh, again, the artifact from the EFA report that I just talked about in the last slide, and uh, what you want to do is translate that into a query logic uh, shown down here. Again, you can use different telemetry data sources, could use Windows event logs or Sysmon. I love to use uh, Sysmon a lot, but in this particular example, I'm uh, showing uh, it through Windows event log. Uh, so with that, uh, I also wanted to talk about how you can scale your threat hunting program because it is important to make it repeatable. It could get overwhelming, but uh, as you saw earlier, there's a lot of uh, overlap in terms of techniques leveraged by different ransomware groups. So you you can scale it up uh, uh, if you follow some of these steps. So a very simple way to scale your threat hunting program is to build your threat hunt library. Uh, it kind of operates from step one to three uh, that I'm highlighting here orange, yes. Research threads, formulate hypothesis, and uh, build your search queries. They can all be mapped into a threat hunt library. Essentially, what a threat hunt library does is maps your threats to mitre attack techniques, which in turn map to your hunt packages. 
So you can again hug, hug, uh, augment your threat hunt library by uh, documenting what you found was normal within your organization. So it helps you in future hunts. You can again add uh, Sigma rules for detection. You can map your hunt packages to Sigma uh, detection rules as well. Uh, that uh, in within your hunt library, just to keep track of what is that. So there's a lot of things that you can do. And a simple way uh, that you can do that is just build a, a, a library simply in X, Excel, that something like this, where you have the hypothesis mapped to hunt names, which are act, then mapped to your techniques that were observed and the method that was actually used. What I also like to do is I... Uh, give IDs to the hunt packages I developed. So you, as an example, you see here h.exec-001, which essentially means uh, uh, the exec here is execution. So it tells me, oh, this is a hunt package that looks for execution uh, uh, tactic. And uh, I also like to ID my the Sigma rules that I create. So uh, it's it makes your life easier in the longer run if you have these IDs as well that uh, uh, you have created. Uh, and uh, these are some of the hunt packages that I just wanted to share as well with you all. Uh, they correspond to the queries that I talked up about initially. They are, they are all written in Elastic DSL language, uh, which is based on JSON, and you can use them to search uh, hunt uh, in, in if you have an Elasticsearch environment. So uh, this particular package is on execution. Uh, then the next ones are uh, on discovery. And you can see here a uh, uh, tag for through the hunt library as well, how you can map it back to your actual package. And uh, then these are the ones on lateral movement. Uh, and finally, the ones on impact. So you can pretty much use that if you have Elasticsearch within your environment and uh, modify them along the way. Uh, so how do you take it a step further? So now we talked about using Excel, but you can also automate this process of threat hunt library, right? So uh, there's an open source tool that I was working on essentially, which uh, just wanted to highlight uh, what it eventually is, is that you can search in there, you can search through tactic, technique, threat actor, or hypothesis, and it will give you an output uh, uh, or a hunt package, essentially, uh, with, uh, you, that you can use in Elastic. So that is something that uh, uh, I'm planning to uh, launch by end of 2024. So uh, that is something that you can also use to uh, essentially uh, build your library. Uh, and finally, uh, I also wanted to summarize by uh, with these four key takeaways. Uh, this is something that I want you all to remember from this presentation. Uh, the first one is threat hunting is intelligence driven. If you want to make your threat hunt program viable, focus on the threats and threat actors that are relevant to your organization. Uh, scalability is key. Uh, you, how do you do that? You build a threat hunt library uh, that then allows you to make it repeatable uh, again and again, because you have already created those uh, hunt packages on based on some of the techniques used by uh, different threat actors or ransomware groups. Uh, third, automation, full automation is not the solution. Analysis is still human trouble. Hunting cannot be fully automated. You can hunt, uh, you can automate part of that step, part of the process, like the first three steps. But uh, when you need still need a human to differentiate between what is malicious and what is normal. And finally, the outcome, uh, threat hunting not only is used for identifying intrusions that, that were not detecting, detected earlier, but it's also used for uh, fixing your detection gaps uh, so that future evasions are avoided. Uh, and uh, here are some of the sources that I uh, used for my analysis uh, on TDPs uh, and uh, the, uh, you can connect me if you have any questions on LinkedIn or Twitter or X as they say, or also through uh, my podcast. And with that, I am open to questions if you have may have any.